From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined as always with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here. And that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Please listen closely, fellow conspiracy realists. Today's episode concerns uh, an absolutely horrific, brutal crime. It remains unsolved in the modern day. There's almost nothing in the way of solid leads in a a baffling case that has stretched for decades now. This episode will contain at times graphic depictions, descriptions of violence against children as well as adults. As such, it may not be suitable for all listeners, but we talked off air. We believe this story is important and we hope exploring it on air tonight may just possibly in some small way help spread the word and lead to a breakthrough. This is the story of what's called the Setagaya family murders and the so-called faceless man. Here are the facts. Uh, Setagaya or Setagaya City, as it's referred to often in English, it's huge. Uh, You guys know Paul and I have spent some time in Japan. I never made it out there. I haven't been there yet, but it's called a special ward of Tokyo, kind of like how, you know, you have boroughs. Of New York, right? We talked in the past about like how big Tokyo is. It really hit me when we were learning about Setagaya City. So if you look at a map, it's in the southwest of Tokyo, and it's along the Tama River. So it's right at the border of the larger Tokyo metropolis and Kanagawa prefecture. We are not native Japanese speakers. I mean, spoiler alert, so uh, please bear with us if we if we get some pronunciations wrong here. We do have the facts straight. Special wards are pretty big, and this is like the biggest one, the first or second biggest one. Uh, in the U.S., this place would not just be a city in its own right. The population, as of 2020, is just a little bit under 1 million people. That means it has a population larger than several U.S. states. Right. At first I was thinking, like, is this sort of akin to a village? But no, this is not at all. This is much more like a mini country, almost, <laughs> almost. like within a country. It's, it's interesting. Mm-hmm. And this, our story takes place in a relatively well-to-do, not super opulent, but well-to-do neighborhood in Setagaya. It is a place called Kamiso Shigaya. It's, think of it like a Western suburb of Tokyo. It's a family place, a lot of family homes. And, and, uh, you know, following suit with that, it's not a lot necessarily goes on in terms of, um, criminal activity. It's very residential. It's something you might describe as being a little bit of a sleepy kind of peaceful bedroom community. Um, but on December 30th and 31st of the year 2000, that tranquil, peaceful, um, feeling was completely uh, upended, shattered um, at the very end of the year. Um, during that same period, the Miyazawa family uh, was murdered during a home invasion. Hey, uh, now let, let's talk about who that family is. Uh, Miko is 44 years old. This is the father of the family. Uh, Yasuko is the mother. She's 41 years old. And they are there were two children, an eight-year-old named Nina and a six-year-old named Ray, R-E-I. Um, yeah, I think that, is, that therein lies why this is such a tragic story and why we all kind of are in this place with our energy today, because it, it's a family that was slaughtered in their home at a time of celebration, the rest of the town, the rest of the city, the, all of the, the whole area, everybody is preparing to celebrate. And everyone is celebrating, basically, uh, at a time when this family is brutally murdered. Yeah, law enforcement as well is down to skeleton crews. You know, it's it's the border of one year to the next. It's the time when people, even in a notoriously overworked country like Japan— or a notoriously overworked 
country like the U.S., even those even those cultures try to take some time off and and be with their loved ones. Uh, Yasuko, if we want to learn a little more about the family, she had worked in cosmetics until she got married, and then she started essentially a cram school, knowing that you know Japan has a very rigorous, uh, quite competitive education system. Suicides actually quadruple in Japan when some of those exam results get released. Uh, so you need those cram schools. She, You could call it a tutor, but we just want everybody to know it's a lot more intense than the word implies in English. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd heard that term for the first time, actually, in, in an anime um, not terribly long ago, and it wasn't one that I was familiar with. Is that, like, specifically kind of a, a, a Japanese thing? I, I mean, usually here they would maybe be referred to as, like, taking, you know, SAT tutoring or like kind of like you know studying in advance for a specific test um can you talk a little bit more about more about that kind of cultural phenomenon of what a cram school is sure yeah it's uh technically it would be like an extracurricular but it because it doesn't occur in you know the actual school system but it's considered a mandate it's considered a necessity there are things like this in in korea as well what happens is you are a lot of your future success is going to be determined by your performance on these tests. So cram schools, a class in a cram school can last for four to five hours after your actual school is over. So some kids don't get home to even start on their homework until like nine or 10 at night. It's pretty brutal. And my understanding is that she taught those classes in English. Is that correct? That's at least what I had read on, on Reddit, which again, I don't, I don't know if I can verify that. I believe I believe that is correct, Matt. She, um, again, like this would typically, they're going to be focusing on specific tests. So she probably had some specializations. And if one of them was language, then it absolutely makes sense because the best way to learn a language is to, uh, hold discourse in that tongue. Yeah. And I only bring that up to open that door for later in this episode about potentially a student of hers. I think that's wise. Yeah. Uh, and the children, were, let's see, Nina, that's N-I-I-N-A, was in second grade, and Ray, being just six, was a kindergartner. Their bodies were found at 1040 a.m. on December 31st, the very last day of 2000. Yasuko's mother, who lived in a house directly next door, came by. She was concerned because she had tried to call her daughter uh, earlier and had not been able to reach her on the phone. And so this is, if you look at the houses and you can see pictures of them, they are they're pretty much what you would call semi-detached houses in, in Britain or in, in the UK, excuse me. And they were once part of a residential community that had hundreds and hundreds of homes. But there was uh, this move to create a park that plays a role in the story. And as people were getting bought out of the neighborhood, There were fewer and fewer houses, and they were getting paid a lot of money, what would be called compensation money, to relocate. So this family, uh, the Miyazawa family, Mikio Miyazawa, his wife and kids, uh, they live next to his in-laws, basically, and there are two of only four houses left in the neighborhood. Yeah, and we should just say right behind both of these houses is that park you're speaking about, Ben. And we're saying how nothing really happens in this town. There's no, you know, brutal crime like this. There are little annoyances like there are in every other place. And one of those annoyances was part of that park, right? And the skate park. Skaters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, the, yeah, this is the kind of suburb where the big news would be that someone complained. Mm-hmm. About this the skate park, right? Or someone was seen uh, punk and drublick and so on. So this in this sleepy town, what it's horrific because the grandmother is the one who discovers the scene of the crime at ten forty a.m. She goes just next door. Uh, the father, the wife, and the eldest child, the daughter, have been repeatedly stabbed in incredibly brutal ways. And the youngest family member, the boy, whose room was on the second floor, had been strangled, probably first, probably before the rest of the family was murdered. Tokyo police 
arrive. They start investigating. It's an investigation that continues even today in 2023. It's one of the biggest murder investigations in all of Japanese history. It didn't take them long to determine a rough timeline. They said the murders occurred probably somewhere around 11.30 p.m. to just after midnight, like 12.05. And it looked like a home invasion. As we're going to see, the police were incredibly thorough, credit where it's due. Uh, They have a real solid sense of a timeline. They have an absurd amount of physical evidence up to and including DNA. What they do not have, however, is the killer. More than 20 years after the murders, this criminal remains on the loose and possibly could be listening to this show. Here's where it gets crazy. Let's walk through this timeline because again, the the police have been, they, they seem a hundred percent convinced that they, they know the timeline up to and including the order of the murders. That's right. Um, they believe, or at least the narrative that the, the police um, constructed uh, was that the killer entered through an open window on the second floor bathroom, the back of the house. Um, the rear of the house is directly next to a park called Soshigaya Park, and the killer uh, was believed to have reached the window by climbing up a tree and then um, uh, you know, removing the screen from the window. Strangely, the light in that room was supposedly on, which is an odd choice for, uh, you know, someone entering a home. To you'd pick think that window. Yeah. Yeah. You'd go to a darkened room or something, but. Hmm. They also noted that if this were a robbery, um, there's a lot of speculation we'll see because there is weirdly enough, there's a dearth of evidence to support for like for any kind of motive. Uh, we have a lot of evidence for what happened, but not a lot of evidence for why it happened. Uh, so it could be random, it could be targeted. You know, often uh, in a home invasion, people have a misconception and they say robbers want to look for the most wealthy homes. It's not entirely true. Successful robbers want to look for accessible homes. Um, but the, and, and with that in mind, it is weird to go into a lighted window specifically. I've got a picture of the, uh, of the house here. And if you look at it, um, part, it, it's kind of hard to tell which window this would have been, but uh, some of the windows are, have bars on them. Uh, but you can see there are a lot of trees close by. The park really does a butt right to the rear of the house. I don't know. It makes you wonder how much they knew about the house in advance, right? Mm-hmm. Because the killer went directly to the youngest child's room after entering the bathroom, and the kid's room was next to the second floor bathroom. The killer used their bare hands to strangle the child. Um, possibly this was to minimize noise. The father, Mikio, down in the in the living room slash study area. He clocks something is wrong. He runs up the first floor stairs. This house has three stories. The mother and the daughter are already asleep on the third story. The father catches the murderer. The struggle ensues. We know that the father injured the killer, and then the killer took the father's life. Uh, He was armed with a knife, a specific type of knife, a sashimi bocho knife, which is used conventionally to make sashimi. A long, uh, very sharp, thin blade, you know, that comes to a a, a very sharp point. Mm -hmm. And it appears that the killing blow was, or the most damaging blow was to the father's head. The knife was stabbed in with such force that a piece of the blade actually broke off. Yeah, Um, and that was in the police report. Of course, um, the killer then went on to attack Yasuko and uh, Nina with the remaining part of the blade uh, and also then, I believe, obtained an additional knife from the house. This this sashimi blade was one he had brought with him, correct? Or was that correct. also? OK, so then the second knife was one he found in the home, uh, a different yeah. type of blade called a uh, Sontoku knife. And part of that is so strange to me, just when you... <laughs> If you look at the diagram of where the victims were found, right, 
Um, Ray was in it, was in his bed. That's where he was found. The father was found at the bottom of the staircase, kind of near the door area. And then the uh, mother and child were found up at the top of the staircase, kind of to the side of it, I guess, around a, a bit of a corner. And with the just, mother over the daughter. Yeah, the mother attempting to protect the daughter. Um, and just imagining where it all took place, right? If you're a crime scene investigator and you're trying to come up with all those facts that we just stated, just, uh, that's a, that's a tough thing to do, but it's also in my mind, really hard to completely get a picture of what exactly happened and, you know, where the killer came in. But in this case, and we're going to keep saying it, there's so much evidence that's left at this scene that you, you really could kind of piece it together. I want to get to that part. Yeah. We're talking the, the extraordinary thing here is that the killer does not leave the scene of the crime. Uh, the killer stays for at least two hours, possibly up to 10 and the entire time. Uh, they are, we're certain it's male. The entire time this murderer is leaving tons of evidence using the family computer or hopping online around one in the morning eating and drinking stuff from the fridge. Uh, he disconnected the landline and that landline disconnection is, you know, what actually led to the discovery of the body. So recently after the incident, if we think in terms of, you know, the other variables, uh, a family murdered like this during a massive holiday could have gone unreported for much longer. Uh, so he, he drank a bunch of barley tea. We know he ate melon. That was around. Uh, he, he ate four little ice cream containers. He used the restroom and he didn't flush. So they had his feces as well. Uh, and then he also used fe- uh, first aid kits. They found towels with blood on them. Some of it his. Uh, he napped on the sofa in the living room on the second just, floor. Wow. They, I mean, they think. Yeah. Yeah. They think. I mean, to me, this is the kind of thing you picture in, like, you know, um, uh, Silence, Silence of the Lambs type film, you know, where it's like a killer who is just so callous and or unconcerned with being caught that they just linger around, you know, and then hang out and like sort of live in this. You know what I'm thinking of? It was not Silence of the Lambs. It was actually the uh, it's called um, it was the original Hannibal Lecter film by Brian De Palma called Manhunter. And there is a killer who kind of does this, who like goes into homes, does home invasions, kills the family, and then sort of hangs around and just sort of like occupies the life of that family. And that's just utterly chilling to think about. Um, you also have to wonder if there's some deep seated psychological uh, issues at work here that would cause someone to be so unconcerned with being caught. I'd really quickly, off fair, Paul corrected me. Uh, actually, Manhunter was directed by Michael Mann, not Brian De Palma. But I do kind of, I don't know, I, maybe I switch those guys up in my head sometimes. They have similar stylistic choices, but really cool film. Well, let's, get, let's stay for one second. Just because I do think you're onto something there, Noel, it does feel like either this person was extremely comfortable with death and murder and murdering people to the point where they would just stick around like this, or I think you're right, something is really off. There's a, some kind of state mental state that this person is in where they're not, they even don't know what's re- going on. they're not even registering <laughs> yeah. really uh, the stakes or what, what's happening. Unless you have repeatedly been in situations where you take people's lives, we have to naturally assume that a perpetrator of crimes like this will experience shock, a, a profound amount of shock possibly disassociation, you know, um, mental state definitely comes into play here. I agree with you guys. Well, and they might be losing a lot of blood. Quite possibly. Yeah. Um, but they wouldn't have lost enough blood to impede their escape because as we'll see, they got away. The, the murderer did some things that also would ordinarily point toward motive, but we'll see why this is difficult to say anything conclusively the house had been ransacked like you know how it is if you've lived in a family house you you probably have a drawer somewhere with uh valuable paperwork right birth certificates uh bills utilities etc all all the jazz all that stuff well the drawers containing that stuff they were 
torn open. There were papers scattered everywhere. Some papers had been dumped in the bath, some in the commode. And some money was taken, specifically money from the cram school where people were paying cash, but not all of it. The killer actually left a lot of money, and they also left a ton of items that they had brought to the house. The The broken knife was found on the scene. Uh, there was, and This stuff was on the sofa. A scarf, a hip bag, kind of like, think like a fanny pack, or sometimes they call them a bum pack, uh, a sweater, a jacket, hat, gloves, shoes, two handkerchiefs, one of which was probably used to um, wield the knife and one that may have been used kind of like a mask. Yeah, because one had been ironed, right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. It's really weird. Uh, Also, the handkerchiefs had Dracar Noir on them. It's just weird that that would be... the cologne? Yeah, the cologne. Yeah, okay. Which has a very specific scent, right? It does, and you'd have to imagine that if that that there could be DNA involved in that as well, maybe sweat or whatever it might be. I mean, good lord! You know, and you point out Ben in in your research that uh, it's like the killer went out of his way or went out of their way to leave evidence. And I think the previous conversation that we have maybe indicates another element there might be that it wasn't that they were going out of their way to leave evidence, but just that there was a lack of awareness. You know, a lack of care uh, because of any number of reasons that we'll, we'll discuss further and get into. Or, and this is just conjecture on my part, guys, the killer was awoken suddenly after sleeping on that sofa or falling asleep by the and grandmother and had to just GTFO and just left everything there on the sofa. I, that's just, I think, a possibility. It is a possibility. Uh, there are also shoe prints. We know the killer was wearing size 11 white running shoes. These were a type of shoe that were manufactured in South Korea. No shoes of this type and this size were sold in Japan. Because what the police did after this was to track down the provenance of any of these items. They found that uh, some of the clothing, not the shoes, but some of the other clothing and that broken sashimi knife Uh, had both been purchased in Kanagawa Prefecture. They analyzed the poop. They saw that the murderer in the 24 hours leading up to the crimes had eaten string beans and sesame seeds. They they know a lot about this criminal. Um, There's also, you'll see a report that uh, the computer went online twice, uh, once at 1.18 a.m. in the wee hours and another a second time at 10 a.m. Uh, but police now believe that that 10 a.m. Uh, hop online with the computer was because the grandmother had perhaps accidentally moved the mouse when she discovered the crime scene. They, they did some good police work here. And, um, of course, people are... People are baffled. People want closure. There's no shortage of independent investigators who will allege that there was incompetence or even corruption on the part of the Japanese police. But we see that they they did digging that led to some pretty important breakthroughs. Like they found the provenance where the knife and the clothing were met, was manufactured. It turns out that the the sweater left there is pretty rare. Only 130 versions of this sweater were made and sold. And police were able to track down 12 different people who purchased those sweaters. Imagine those conversations. You bought a sweater and the police are at your door. You know what I mean? That's a very strange way. That's a very strange day to have. Uh, None of those people, in the opinion of the authorities, could have committed those murders. And there's one more piece of evidence that, I don't know, we'll see what everybody thinks, but this this really surprised me. This is not what I was expecting. We'll, we'll fill you in after a word from our sponsors. We've returned. Let's talk about the hip bag, the bum bag, the fanny pack. Uh, Yeah, so we've already seen with other pieces of evidence that were recovered that signs are pointing to this person probably not living full time in Japan or maybe not being from Japan um, and being here as a foreigner in one way or another. And that's the same thing you find with the bag, because inside 
there is sand that is not from Japan. Yeah, and this is impressive. You can trace sand. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can trace sand. That means somewhere out there, there, there's a database, likely multiple databases, of different types of sand. This sand, as you said, Matt, does not come from Japan, not any part of Japan. It is all the way across the Pacific. This sand originates from the Nevada desert, most likely from an area around Edwards Air Force Base. Whoa. Right? It's now, pretty strange. Well, let's talk about that because, you know, someone who is military or ex-military, at least trained with a knife in that way, um, that would make sense for the severity of, you know, this crime and the cool, potential cool displayed after such a horrendous set of acts. So, I don't know. That's interesting. Right. Yeah. And I looked around too to see um, what sort of military, U.S. military bases are located in the in in Tokyo, and there are seven U.S. military facilities of some sort. Around. Anything near Kanagawa? Um, not necessarily super near, but there is obviously U.S. military presence in Japan. Police have the DNA. They have the fingerprints. They have bloody fingerprints. And they, of course, they ran this through their files. Whomever this person is, their info is not available in any of those databases. So we know this person, whomever they may be, never got booked for a previous crime in Japan. Yeah, that's just really troubling that they're not in any databases, or at least that the Japanese police who are investigating the crime have access to, right? They're not in right. any of those databases. Then you, I'm sure there's cross-referencing that was done, but I, I wonder how wide that DNA has been distributed over the years to look at other databases. Um, it also makes me wonder about one of the forensic genealogy. Maybe there's something there with this case. But let's talk about what we know about the killer. Yeah, let's also note on the database thing that um, one of the big questions I have at least two is just on the uh, just on the provenance of that sand is it is it enough for Japan to convince the U.S. to run this stuff through military databases? Yeah, why not? Yes, yes, I'm saying yes. I'm saying yes as well. <laughs> let's go. But we didn't we didn't find. Uh, at least so far, we haven't we haven't found any evidence of that or whatever happened. They didn't set a ma it didn't set off a match. Uh, and like you were saying, Matt, uh, based on this, the Tokyo police have made some rough estimates about the person, some of which are controversial. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is the height. So the height of the person is around 170 centimeters, which is five feet. 5.7 inches, so about five foot six. So a fairly short uh, male. We also know that this person was very thin. They found, because of the clothes that were left behind, they found that his waist was rather small. Yeah, yeah. And they also believe that he would have been born sometime between 1965 to 1985, uh, conjecturing that he was a younger person, 15 to 35 years old at the time of the crime. This is based on their estimates regarding the level of phys physical fitness required to get into the house and commit the murders. And the idea of him having a slim build is also based on that. Yeah, climbing a tree to get in a second story window. In a relatively small window at that. So he was also, unfortunately, this is part of the research that has to be done. That they looked at the bodies, medical examiners and detectives came in and uh, they concluded that the killer was most likely right-handed due to the nature of the wounds. As we said here, there's a lot of blood and you can learn quite a bit from human blood. The killer had type A blood. So that means they could not have been a member of the Miyazawa family. That's one of the things they had to check, you know, unfortunately. Uh, the killer is male, and there was some in-depth discussion of the killer's genealogical or genetic background, whether they were of mixed race, because originally you'll see reports where they say the maternal DNA indicates uh, some European lineage, 
And the way, the first way it was phrased was the mother is of European descent, possibly from a South European country near the Mediterranean or Adriatic Sea. Paternal DNA shows a father of East Asian descent. However, we have to remember 2000 was two decades ago. Uh, DNA testing, as, as you guys know from various shows you've EP'd, has come a long way since then. And it wasn't like a testing at this time. One of the primary uh, objections I've seen to it is that they're saying, well, maternal DNA could just be an ancestor on the mother's side. You know what I mean? Like if there's a small amount of European DNA, then I don't know. And it's shady the way the public got that news about the DNA. It wasn't from the police originally. It was from someone who worked at a university that was also testing it and they leaked it to the press. Well, yeah. And now that we're 23 years on and we've got things like 23andMe and all of these companies, like why not test that DNA all over the place? Because they've still got samples. I mean, put that thing in every database, see what you find. You might get a ping from a known relative who might be able to help point out the whereabouts of, or, or have information, you know? You go uh, interrogate this relative, and they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, cousin Steve or whatever was always kind of weird, you know? We and should, was, uh, yeah, was at Edwards Air Force Base. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, there, there's another thing. There's a, a specific um, piece of the DNA that is more common in people from China or Korea. And this goes back to what you were setting up earlier, Matt, the idea that this person may not, this criminal may not have been a Japanese national or may not be based in Japan or from there. And this analysis led the police to contact Interpol because they currently, uh, one of the prevailing opinions is that This killer might not be a Japanese national, might not even be present in Japan anymore. Because remember, Japan is a big destination for tourism, for kids on gap year, for international business. A lot of people visit Japan or stay for a number of months or stay for a number of years. And as we said right now, this is one of the largest murder investigations in the entire history of of Japan. We're talking, the, the number keeps changing as time goes on. 260,000 individual investigators with eyes on this case over the years, thousands and thousands of pieces of evidence, um, more than like 12,000 individual pieces, thousands and thousands of tips that so far haven't really gone anywhere. Nothing. That's why over the years, the press started calling this criminal the faceless man. They also used another phrase for this that uh, some of us may have heard which I don't love, called the Goldilocks murders. You guys heard it called that? It's gross, but I get it. Yeah, yeah, it feels somehow disrespectful. Yeah. Uh, I want to mention something that was brought up in some of the reporting, and it's something I didn't think about, and I honestly can't see really the relevance here, but I just want to get your guys' opinion. Um some of some of the reporting stated that the initial team of investigators that went to this scene were essentially a reserve unit or something because of basically everybody's on holiday. So this is like holiday. the team that the B team or C team that comes in to do crime scene investigation and all of the parts, basically all the information we're working on was based on this team's findings. I don't see how that could really have an effect on you know, the stuff we're analyzing right now and the things we're discussing, but just want to put it out there to you guys. Do you think there's a possibility that either stuff was tainted or, or seen wrong or anything like there's that? There's always, I just don't see how that's pop. I, I mean, I, yes, of course there's a possibility for sure. I just, so many opportunities, various opportunities to, to get clean DNA, to get clean samples. I mean, he left poop in the toilet, you know? I mean, I just don't understand. It's like it's like a slam dunk. It just seems. I mean, you know, I think this is what it seems like. If the investigation had not continued for so long, with so many people re-examining different pieces of it, then I could see a stronger possibility mm-hmm. that maybe a reserve unit um, did the did the wrong thing. But we have to remember too, a reserve unit is not 
necessarily like the JV version. They're yeah, not the exactly. B squad. They're they're the skeleton crew. They're the folks who drew the short straw, and we'll just have to celebrate New Year's next time. Exactly. You know what I mean? Well, in everything, you know, even in the year 2000, everything is digitized, right? So mm-hmm. the, even the stuff that we're examining right now, it's the it's the same. It's not the exact same, right? Crime scene photos and all of those uh, pieces of evidence that were collected, but it's very similar. It's digitized media that everybody else is looking at of what the place looks like and what was there. Wait, wait, sorry, was this was this 99 rolling into 2000 or 2000 rolling into 2001? 2000 into 2001. 2001. Okay, so it wasn't amidst the whole Y2K no. chaos. No, no. I, mean, I mean, not that that matters. I'm just saying, you know, the Y2K killer, I could just see that. Oh, yeah, I can see that as well. I mean, people can be kind of soulless when they start putting those names on things. But I I just mean even even arguing that somebody lost it because of put the name um, to mention things like Goldilocks and Faceless. But just so you know, that kind of stuff can't be exploitative. I I just meant specifically if it were during that time, the argument could be made that people were really like going bananas you know mm. because of paranoia about all the things you're describing i mean like digital you know computers resetting and all of that stuff but there's all kinds of doomsday preppers and stuff i mean i know that's not what what happened but that's just what occurred to me it's a good observation too i mean that's because again nothing occurs in a vacuum and that's why there are no shortage of theories attempting to explain this crime and to be very clear with everybody none of the theories that we're about to discuss have been proven. And we'll dive into those theories after a word from our sponsor. Theories. Okay, the killer's motive, motives, whatever they may be, remain elusive today. Again, none of these theories have been conclusively proven. That's why there's still theories. There are some people who are convinced they figured it out which we can talk about. But right now, I think the the biggest thing on the, uh, the biggest one that you'll hear, especially in the early days, was suspicion of a robbery, right? Yeah. Given the fact that this is a pretty wealthy area, we talked about at the beginning there, and the fact that the house that we're talking about here, the one that got entered into, was fairly isolated out by that park. It would make sense that it would be targeted in at least a um, a moment of opportunity, right? Maybe you're at the park and you see these kind of lone houses right here and you think, oh, well, I'm going to go in there and take everything that I can that's not locked down. Yeah, I mean, maybe. I, we know that one of the, one of the theories argues, uh, they draw on co- all kinds of stuff. They say that uh, there was a, a person aware of the compensation being paid to relocate right from the park and that they may have believed that that money existed in cash in the house. Maybe that was part of it, uh, which is, you know, uh, an attempt to explain the paperwork being shuffled around the fact that some money was taken, but again, other money was left on the scene and the, the Miyazawa's had sold their home, but they just hadn't moved yet. This somehow, this led some people to speculate there could have been a hired killer and it could have been a hit. The The biggest proponent of this is an investigative journalist named Fujima Ichihashi, uh, who claims to have solved the case. I don't understand the whole idea of how, I mean, this is a hit. This is the least successful hitman. I could ever imagine hiring, you know, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's insane that this person hasn't been caught yet, but you know, if you're a hired killer, you're going to come, you're going to pop in, pop out, do your business and leave no trace. Yeah. Ideally, unless you have been, unless you have been paid to do specific things like to kill someone in a specific way or to remove or leave or remove or deposit specific items. It's it. I, I tend to agree with you because it is very clear that at least two of the victims, the mother and daughter, were brutalized, were were stabbed and attacked after they had died, far after they had died. So this could be indicative of an emotional motivation for the crimes. If someone's doing a job, then they're probably not going to stick around. Remember the other family murder case that we did relatively recently where the bodies were posed 
sort of like a, a creepy sculpture. Mm-hmm. Like, and we talked a lot about the motivations there, you know, as to whether this was done to like send a message, you know, maybe you're even like paying extra to get someone to, to do some of these, these things to really like, you know, make it appear as, as, as though something different happened or as though there was some sort of cultic reasoning behind what was, you know, ultimately just a, a murder. I, I'm not saying they're, they're, they're that similar, but it's something to think about. We did talk about a similar angle on that story, and the, the name of the, the family is eluding me on that one. The Sherman double murders That's right. up there in Canada. Yeah, That's I right. was thinking the same thing with that murder in Toronto. That's actually specifically what I was thinking because we had talked in that episode about how it could be possible that someone with an emotional motive paid a professional operator to, you know, to do that posing you're talking about, which is not out of the realm of possibility. I agree. Well, well let's let's talk about this this emotional reaction here. So, let's say it was a murder for hire situation. The person was supposed to go in or maybe it wasn't murder for hire. Maybe it was get that money. That's what the job was initially. And you know, the money supposedly that was inside that house that was given to them to move, right? It's for selling their house. Whoever sent the murder for hire believed that was in there and they just wanted that money and maybe that money wasn't at the house. And this person, you know, it, it made this person extremely angry that now they have, you know, been seen by an entire family of people and then it turns into the situation it turned into. That's a possibility, but that seems that seems pretty far fetched to me, at least to it takes my takes a lot of if thens to get there is the issue, right? Like yeah. we we would have to have a lot of things work out just so. And the individual just, you know, to, to be annoyed to that degree would specifically refer to like, oh, now I've been put in this position where I'm at risk. Yeah. So to continuously exhibit behavior that just puts them further yeah. and further at risk just doesn't really line up. I want to talk a little bit about Ichihashi, just so everyone knows where this investigator is coming from jihachi has bona fides and has extensively researched other cases in an incredible way uh their conclusion here remains controversial this is one of the people who believes they solved the case uh they say in their book on this that they got in contact with a south korean national who was only called k like the letter k in the book and that this person k pointed Ichihashi to the direction of the actual killer, a South Korean hitman uh, who is given the pseudonym R, like the letter R, in this book. And Ichihashi says that they spoke to, or they, excuse me, they say they made contact with R, who is a former member of the South Korean military. Further, Ichihashi says they attained the man's fingerprints and these are a match with those collected at the crime scene by the police. That's one author saying this, not a member of Japanese law enforcement. If that's true, then uh, the author needs to, like, what the heck? If that's true, why has there been no arrest made? Exactly. There would be an arrest made if that was true. There there would have to be. We talked about the Buddha statue. Not yet. We haven't gotten to the Buddha statue yet. I'm sorry, this is just... It's interesting and and uh, sinister, right? I mean, I mean, unless I'm misreading it, the idea that perhaps the killer may have even returned to the scene of the crime. Maybe, yeah. That's an interesting one. I mean, there's also, I think this is something we are building toward a little bit earlier. There's the concept of possible revenge. Maybe someone felt emotionally scorned. Maybe they resented the husband. Maybe they resented the mother, something like that. We just, we don't know. It's Well, let's, a lot let's of, get into that. Yeah. Okay. The the cram school, let's get mm-hmm. to the cram school, right? Because there there's poss- there's a possibility here that a five six, uh, very thin person who was potentially you know pretty young was the person who did this, and that could be a student, right? Possibly. It, Doesn't that stuff seem like something a kid would do? Eating ice cream, mm-hmm. you know, drinking, like, you know. Not like flushing the, the toilet? Not flushing the toilet, just eating the junk food, you know, just, yeah, man. Okay, go on. I wow. Well, to me, like, that's 
that's where most of this points, just in my mind, that it's a student that was either angry you. because he was unable to perform on whatever test he was cramming for, right? Or he developed emotional feelings for the, the his teacher or his, you mm-hmm. know, his tutor, which is something an adolescent person going through puberty might do. But what about the sand from, from the United States and, and, and uh, you know, the whole – they were likely not a Japanese citizen. Maybe they I were studying – in yeah, Japan. no, you're right. That's exactly right. You're studying abroad, and then you would be, you would have. Like, this is a private school. This isn't a government fund. You pay to go to the school. The Cram the schools, cash. yeah, yeah. Are pri- private outfits. But then, uh, to play point counterpoint with this, uh, it it seems absolutely unreasonable that the authorities would not have interviewed families associated with the cram school. Oh yeah. Well, it's true. And there wouldn't have been some as well red as flag. Mikio's Something. co-workers. I mean, I think it's I think it's a very valid argument. I was thinking the same too. We just didn't if they talked to the um families and possible students at the cram school to get information, uh, which they absolutely did, then they would have clocked something, right? I mean Maybe the thing we don't know is did they test everybody's fingerprints, right? Well, yeah, or DNA or, you know, any of that. And I doubt they did. I doubt they went around asking for DNA tests from any of those people. They may have later uh, in in later decades, right, as DNA becomes uh, DNA technology becomes more affordable and more sophisticated. And I, I see the idea like we can we can interpret that behavior after the murders as the behavior of an adolescent but again, like so many other people, we're we're attempting to build out possibilities based on very limited information. Totally. And again, it could also have been the behavior of an adult exhibiting some psychosis, you know, mm-hmm. or there's some some fugue state, some, you know, uh, yeah, 100 percent. Um Wow. No, but but when you said that, though, Matt, I was immediately like, yes, but then you're right, Ben. Of course yeah. they would have meticulously gone through. This isn't a massive population I mean, you know, of, of students going to the school. They, they, could have, they could have run through those possibilities relatively quickly. They also ran through the skateboarders mm-hmm. nearby. Uh, we should mention this before you get to the Buddhist statue. So the, there's a skate park in the area, and... Uh, Kids having fun, you know, trying to do kickflips and ollies and all that. Uh, and Mikio, the the father, had complained about the noise from the skate park, uh, which is, you know, something a dad in a suburb will do. But uh, but this led some people to say, hey, because he complained about the skate park, did he? trigger or anger some of the local skateboarders and police actually went and investigated whether that was the case. And they, I don't want to say shook down, but they questioned the local skateboarders. And again, they came up with bupkis. Well, let's talk about this too. Didn't we discuss this in a previous episode, the uh, culture around police investigations in Japan and how it is very different. Uh, I was saving that for the end. Let's do it now. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. You're right. I no, you're right. Wanna... no, you're right. You're right. Because I, uh, one of the concerns is like, that's why we're saying they're doing for what we can tell good police work at the top. Japan has an incredibly high conviction rate. Essentially, if they like you for a crime, you are going to be found guilty. Uh, and, their conviction rate has raised a lot of questions over the years, a lot of very valid questions about how much emphasis is put on determining the true guilt or innocence versus how much is put on successfully closing cases. But, but then to that end is, is maybe the uh, is preponderance threat no, preponderance is a lack of the glut of evidence, uh, maybe um, a bad thing because they can't just pin it on anybody because they have so much damn evidence. So it has to really fit. Mm hmm. So the fact that they they can't that, that you'd think in other words if maybe there were less evidence they would have found some fall guy to pin it on, but in this case because there's so much evidence they can't find the real guy they can't pin it on anybody. Yeah, there's also uh, there there are also uh, some behaviors or procedures of Japanese law enforcement that other countries would find 
either unethical or incorrect. Uh, and so for anybody listening in law enforcement outside of Japan, tell us what you think about this. Uh, this is from Freakonomics. Highly recommend uh, Freakonomics, just if you want to learn interesting things about the world. Japan has this very high conviction rate. Japan famously has a low crime rate too, right? Uh, apparently... If Japanese authorities, for instance, discover a body in a public space, and let's say it has stab wounds, it's clearly a violent death, they'll uh, set standards of like a ticking clock for how much time they have to find a suspect. If they don't find a suspect by that time, it's not an unsolved murder. It's reclassified as a whoosh, whoosh, abandoned body. So the case of manslaughter or murder is no longer officially on the books. They got cooked. Right. So what do you think if you're a law enforcement professional in some other country? Does this happen? Should this happen? Is this the right way to approach things? This also reminds me of our older episode, The Monster with 21 Faces. You guys remember that one? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and what is it? What does it say that this is a 23 year old case and there's still not a single suspect? Right. Exactly. And because of public pressure, of course, and because of the just horrific nature of the crime they cannot do a reclassification trick on this one you simply cannot try to frame this as anything other than a multiple murder well and, and just that's another thing imagine that you live in the area and on the front page of your paper the day you wake up you know on january 1st or you know i think it was I, it, it would have been really on the 31st or the first when you when you read about this thing it's like the first day of a new year. This is the major case that's on the front page. Uh, you would remember that, right, going forward. And that's why I think there's so much that's been written about this case. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And now, now we know that the case definitely stayed, right, in the mind of Japan, in the, in the mind of the community. And I think now we can, let's get to that, that statue. So a few months after the murders, right? Murders again, December 30th, 31st of 2000. In April of 2001, someone went to the neighborhood, went near the house, and they left this uh, two-foot-tall Buddhist statue there. And you can pull up a picture of this. Um, it's, not, it, it, it's not a statue that I was familiar with beforehand, um, but it was... Definitely, it seems to have been left there in reference to the murders. Okay. In reference to the murders, like in honor of the victims or? Unclear. And they still don't know who gave the, um, no, I think it's probably why it sticks out in your mind too. They still don't know who put the statue there. Like, is it like a commemoration where you would Which see at a roadside sense. accident? Yeah. I mean, you know, it is the protector of, of, of lost or dead children, but it also, I don't know, like maybe that's just my or our brains kind of filtering it through pop culture. The idea of a, of a, of a you know, murderer returning to the scene and leaving some token, you know, um, that's where my brain goes. But that's probably the least likely option. This person is probably long, long gone. I just can't, you know, again, the police really treated this with a lot of attention to detail and fastidiousness. And I just can't imagine if this person wasn't utterly in the wind that they wouldn't have, you know, gotten a whiff, a whiff of, of, of this person's whereabouts. Yeah, this is a Jizo uh, Bodhisattva, which is, as we mentioned, considered to be a guardian of dead children. Police, you know, still desperate for leads, police printed thousands and thousands of posters uh, with a photo of the statue and you can pull up you can pull up one of the posters now it's in japanese but you you can see it online and they were hoping members of the public could come forward with information right because again any unanswered question might be the thing that breaks the case uh this set yeah, like it, it's difficult to say just how much this rocked the country of japan it triggered changes in the law for a long time japan had a statute of limitations and as time went on relatives survivors the grandmother who found the bodies remains alive um they were horrified by the idea that due to the statute of limitations this murderer might be found after that statute had um expired 
and then they couldn't be prosecuted. This case, in fact, is the primary reason Japan removed that statute of limitations in 2010, which I think is a positive change. They didn't remove it for everything. They removed it in cases where conviction might lead to the death penalty. And of course, Japan still has the death penalty, and they do it in a very strange way. We talked about this before on air, I think, like how they execute you. They don't tell you what day it is. Yep. Surprise. They just show up. Could be several months. Could be several years. One day, it's the day. Ah, that's an interesting psychological technique. You make it a little bit fear. A, uh, a mind freak. Mm-hmm. And while we're on the subject, you can read a bunch of flyers that have come out over time. Uh, detectives have put them in. Retired detectives have put them in. Uh, supporters of the family. Action groups have printed pamphlets. People hold demonstrations at the train station near the neighborhood or near the house. And police are still handing out flyers each year around December, around the anniversary of the crimes. In 2019, police made plans to tear down the house. You know, Japan in general treats older houses differently from uh, what we might expect in the West. But families and supporters appealed the decision. Uh, And so the house still stands today. You can see a video tour from when one of the survivors opened the house to the press. uh, And it's just heartbreaking, man. I don't say it lightly. It's people who are living just a a wonderful dream of a life uh, just cut short in such a horrible, horrible way. Uh, And this is the same thing that has haunted investigators. Like we were talking off air, uh, Takashi Sushida, who headed the initial investigation, still visits the site regularly, still goes over the clues obsessively, hoping to get a break in the case and has become a, a very close friend of the grandmother. Yeah, I mean, again, I think, I, I, well, I, I, maybe we could revisit like, just for a, a few seconds this this idea of the, the super high conviction rate. I don't think we're necessarily making any accusations there, but is is the conjecture that perhaps, especially in a part of the country that maybe is a little bit more iron-fisted in terms of the way they govern, that maybe some of these cases are being pinned on fall individuals? Is that oh, of, absolutely okay? Just just make just put it on the table. Just making sure absolutely we're not. interrogations are not recorded. Um, stress positions are used. They will lock you up for days. Apparently, the kind of thing is if they're actually arresting you and detaining you, and they like you for the crime, they'll just do their best to get you to say you did it, unless they find someone they like better. <laughs> yeah, unless they find unless there's a new bell of the criminal ball. Yes. So it is unusual in this case they wouldn't have even had a, a, a true person of interest. And I think maybe I was right or we were all leaning in the same direction that the absolute overwhelming amount of evidence could have been a hindrance to them being able to do that. That may be the case. Uh, we, we are not, we're not able to make the call on that. There, there was something really interesting. Uh, Sushita said uh, a few years back, year or two back, uh, He said the same thing we were saying earlier. DNA has come a long way. And he said, why haven't we used DNA to attempt to make a facial composite, right? Which is technology that now exists. It's very imperfect, but it's something. He's saying, let's give a face to this faceless man. As we record, that hasn't happened. I don't know how much how much health help it would be because we've talked about it in the past, those creating a face from DNA evidence is, I don't know. It doesn't account for anything that might happen as a result of environment, you know, or lifestyle. It's, it's still, it's something. And I think at this point you got to do something, right? Yeah. I, I think forensic genealogy is the way to go. Sen- sen- like, just send out that DNA for sampling, testing, add it to the database, see where where those connections are. And I think you, you'll you get as close as you'll ever get to solving this thing. But let's talk quickly, guys. We didn't even mention on the night of the murders and like a couple of days before the murders and even like the morning after, there were eyewitness accounts of somebody wearing this 
strange i i call it a fisherman's hat i don't know what like a hat hat. it's like yeah but it's you know the material isn't very uh stiff it's like a I don't floppy. know how to describe it. It's kind yeah, of a well, floppy hat. It, it'll like, have it's a wrinkled. band, a band like around distressed. the top. Sometimes Ooh. you can tuck things. I think there, of it as a fishing know. hat. I That's, agree completely. My grandfather wore one all the time, so I always, I always think of it like that. And then the jacket. Uh, there were eyewitness accounts of somebody matching that description all over the place, all over town, at a train station, at uh, what else? Um, getting into a cab. Uh, there was a cab, a taxi cab that left that early, early that morning. Three men got in, so it was a shared ride in a taxi cab. And one of the three men was bleeding all over the taxi. They left a bunch of blood behind. Is it possible that that's a person that got into that cab? I think it might be. Again, um, possible. There was uh, one eyewitness account that said around 11:30 p.m. on the night of the murders, somebody was hurriedly like rushing. In the direction of the house, not directly towards the house, right? Because house is kind of isolated. Maybe that's not what they actually saw or where he, this person was headed. But they matched that same description with the hat and the jacket. If the eyewitnesses are reliable. Right. From 23 years ago. Right. Yeah. But I mean, it's a good point. It also calls to mind, again, the Sherman murders, where we had to talk about eyewitness accounts, right? Of the guy walking. Some unknown individual. Uh, and then, yeah, so the the police were, I mean, they did amazing things. Being able to trace down the clothing is impressive. Like and the sand? To, yeah, and the sand. There's some secrets. There, There's like a sand repository. There, There's now we know there's not one, but multiple people who just know a, 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 like a cartoonishly disturbing amount about sand. Mm-hmm. I don't think it was until quite recently that we learned there are different grades of sand and there's good sand and then there's the bad sand and you can only build with certain types of sand. Guys, what what do you think about a traveling, a student who was traveling maybe with their father or mother who was in the military and was studying, going to the cram school, like maybe came from the United States, from that exact area near Edwards Air Force Base and was a student and was angry for one reason or another and did this. And not, not, not just, ang- I mean, yes, I, I, that's where that's, I think where uh, it's easy to have your mind go in that direction. But I think this is a, this is a severely disturbed and demented individual that could have been set off by any number of perceived slights, perhaps, you know, or being feeling as though they were on some sort of outsider. The idea of revenge, I mean, revenge is is complicated. You know, it, it, it's like, is it enough just to kill somebody? Do you want to do you want to make them suffer? All of that stuff. But this to me and the behavior indicates just a an incredibly deranged individual and that it would have been, you know, the kind of thing that maybe even they just did for fun. One, it does not seem to be a professional operation, right? Um, just based on some of the, just the, the lack of operational hygiene, right? It's a very cold thing to call it, but you get the gist. Two, I think because of the lack of really compelling evidence, it's easy for us to put kind of tropes on this thing. The, the, the trope of the, like, the scorned disassociated kid or the, you know, almost like a Columbine kind of thing. That's very familiar to us here in the U S because mass shootings continue. Um, and, and it's a very familiar concept and it's quite possible. The, the damning thing is we just don't have enough detail there. If it's someone traveling from abroad, which I also do feel is there's a strong likelihood of that. Then, if they are associated with the military, just again, why is that DNA not sent out, as you said, Matt, everywhere, especially to U.S. military? I mean, is it something they want to stay away from because of the crimes committed by U.S. nationals in Okinawa and in other areas? It's a very sensitive subject. I think that's exactly crisis, what it is. Perhaps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially in the moment when this occurred and they're like, well, there does seem to be some, there's evidence that does seem to tie this person potentially to the United States. Well, okay, great. What is that evidence? Uh, sand that was in one of the things. Uh, yeah, get out of here. We're, you can't. You can't have access to any of our records. You know. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's what it feels like to me. 
And this is one of those cases where we cannot conclusively give an answer, but we hope very much that there is one. As we record today, there is a reward uh, for 20 million yen, the largest reward in Japanese history. Matt, you pointed out that's uh, north of $145,000 U.S. uh, for credible information leading to the arrest of a suspect. If you have any information about this, there is a number you can call specifically for this. Um, Be aware that your country codes may differ depending on where you are in the world. That number is 03-3482-0110. Again, that's 03-3482-0110. Guys, one last thing for me before we close, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, do you think that the lack of, or, or rather, the, the lack of motive uh, and, and the difficulty that police are having, given you know the uh, insane amount of evidence, implies that maybe this was just a random act? It's also a possibility. Yeah. It's, a, it's also a possibility. Because yeah. that makes it harder to connect if it's just somebody that... Yeah, but you know there there are some things that indicate there was some premeditation or, or or knowledge of the house, but that could have been gleaned pretty quickly. You know, maybe following the kid around at a park and and then just say, oh, a kid lives right over there. You know, let's just see how this shakes out. But just remember, since the DNA was not in any of the Japanese da- databases, this would be the first crime that the person committed that was serious enough that he was caught for. Right. Oh, yeah. I yeah. don't know. No. That's, and again, that's not lost on me either. Yeah. Not impossible. It's not an impossible situation. There have been things where people have stored up a lot of the evil inside themselves and they appear to have snapped overnight. But in each of those cases, there's a long, there's a long buildup once you know what to look for. If you'd like to learn more about this case, I uh, highly recommend checking out the limited series, The Faceless Podcast. It's a seven part dive into. The details into um, deep into a lot of the theories. Uh, full disclosure: This is not a podcast we're associated with creating. It's just a good source if you want to learn more. With that, folks, we're gonna we're going to end it here, uh, and we want to know what you think. Is there a likelihood that this case may ever be solved? Why or why not? And tell us about your experiences with Japanese law enforcement. We'd like to hear them. Uh, and we are very, we aim to be easy to find online. We do. You can find us at the handle Conspiracy Stuff on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. On Facebook, we also have our Facebook group. Here's where it gets crazy. Uh, you can also find us under the handle Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram and, and TikTok, if those are more your, uh, your things. Hey, if you like using your phone, you can speak to us. Just dial 1-833-STD-WYTK. It's a voicemail system. You've got three minutes to leave a message. Please give yourself a cool nickname and let us know if we can use your voice and message on the air. If you've got more to say than can fit in three minutes, why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.